got to be prepared to take your hat off and say. I'm the United Kingdom by our politicians, by our police work. The institutional denial um, that I've experienced both within my own police force, South Yorkshire Police, bear in mind I've worked for South Yorkshire Police with an exemplary record for 17 years. Um, that institutional denial is a concern and you see in more, you know, standing back and taking a look at, the look at all this, you see numerous things apparently with justice. The introduction of draconian terrorist laws, such as the Inquiries Act in 2005 and the Terrorism Act in 2006. You see in the erosion of civil liberties and you see in numerous miscarriages of justice. Not just in the fact that within the London bombings they never had a proper inquiry, they never had post-mortems, but we had subsequent related uh, issues the Kingston trial were three collaborators, so-called collaborators of these so-called alleged bombers um, that I believe were actually set up as patsies. Uh, but these, these bombers that had never been proven guilty, these suicidal bombers that had never been proven guilty in a suicide, in, in a court of law, had, the, had three collaborators that were charged uh, and tried, but on two separate occasions found not guilty. Um, now all of that meant, as far as I was concerned, that, um, looking back, that the, the, the terror threat is uh, perpetrated by our government to heighten the fear in the public, uh, to allow the government to bring in these draconian measures, measures and to divide the, 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 the country so that people are fearful of the Muslim communities and it's uh, the threat from coming from Islamic, young Islamic jihadists. And the case in point here, I think, the most telling program since is the BBC program Generation Jihad that shows um, young jihadists and, and a number of case studies in a terrible light um, that is simply not balanced and is blatant propaganda. And when I see Sir Norman Bettison, the Chief Constable, the former Chief Constable of West Yorkshire, um, talking about um, this going on for the next generation without being satisfactorily resolved, without the merest mention of the possibility that oh, um, the, the real underlying problem here is that the London bombings were not committed by four terrorists. They were Muslim from Beeston and, and Aylesbury. In fact, they were committed by our intelligence services with, with com full complicity by our Prime Minister then and probably involvement with Mossad. That, you know, when we look at what Tony Blair did straight away, this has all the hallmarks. This was done in the name of Islam and Jack Straw saying this has all the hallmarks of, uh, of Al-Qaeda. Uh, I'm sorry, when you can take a good look at this as a, with your intelligence hat on, intelligence analysis hat on, this has all the hallmarks of an inside job. And you can, you can do this reasonably scientifically because you can list all the facts, not just at the time, but from the later hearing, the Lady Justice Hallett inquiry. And these are facts. And the way my approach would simply be, of all these thousand and one facts that are available, do these facts when you look at them and stand back, point more towards a conceptual model that this is an inside job or that the government are telling the truth. And on so many occasions, I'm afraid, it points towards the government narrative is untruthful. Now if the government narrative is untruthful in so many areas, then the government have got something very serious to hide. And when the government, when, when the normal course of justice is not followed, so we've never had a hearing to establish guilt, we didn't have post-mortems. The Lady Justice Hallett inquiry revealed information and models about the carriages and the number 30 bus, which when, upon analysis, simply um, did nothing to confirm the government narrative. On the contrary, it, conflict, it contradicted it. But it wasn't 
evaluated properly within the Lady Justice Hallett inquiry. There was no scope within the terms of reference and within the hearing that unfolded for any critical evaluation of what was been presented. So everything was been presented as unvarnished truth, without a critical eye, but close examination of these exhibits that were shown, the models of these carriages and the witness statements, it simply didn't add up. So there are so many anomalies that, um, just like 9-11, it's blatantly obvious that they were inside jobs, and it's not rocket science. So, in, in that wider context, uh, you know, 18 months down the line, I definitely see it, there's a new world order at work, and a massive cover-up by our government. And the problem is, there's only one politician, to the best of my knowledge, that's spoken out against either of these two attacks, and that was Michael Meacher. So Michael Meacher did at once upon a time stick his head above the parapet, but it wasn't long before he's been quietened and he won't speak out about 9-11, in spite of it being so obvious. And um, why is that? Well, these people running our country, running this global elite, and immensely powerful people, and I think there's fear. There's fear to speak out, there's corruption in high places, and there's cowardice. And uh, I think in my situation, it's disappointing to be dismissed, but I'm going through an interesting employment appeal, whereby the way it's turned might allow me to produce the analysis that so far has not actually appeared in the court itself, in the employment tribunal. So, um, at the moment, my case is still alive on, and going through to the Employment Appeal Tribunal in London, where it's been fought on the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Now, that offers me a chance um, to reveal the analysis that I have, to reveal the deficiencies in the process that I was asked to do, which was a strategic threat assessment matrix. And on both counts there, there's a, public, there's, a, there's a duty of care for me because while I was alleging criminality on the terror threat on, and the fact that I was alleging uh, state complicity with the London bombings. Now, under the Whistleblowing Act, or the Public Interest Disclosure Act, I should be entitled to do that without fear of being dismissed. And on the second area, I had been, as a principal intelligence analyst for two years prior to 2010, I had been um, the biggest critic of the strategic threat assessment risk matrix models that were being asked to be introduced by the National Police Improvement Agency and been checked by the Her Majesty's Inspectorate from Constabulary, the HMIC. But my first degree was applied statistics, and I saw these models that we were being asked to produce as, as a gimmick and totally unreliable and invalid from a statistical viewpoint. And then, more to actually um, confirm a narrative rather than to analyse what the threat was. Uh, and these were very hideously crude models that didn't make sense, uh, yet principal intelligence analysts across the length and breadth of the country were producing these for senior management to confirm the decision making that was already being made. And inevitably, what the government was were coming out with and MI5 were coming out with was a very dumbed down threat level assessment, which had five categories. Critical, substantial and severe were generally it would hover between those three over time. But you're never told when it varied and when it lowered or hired what what was the basis of it. But it was there to lead the people to believe that there was a threat. Invariably there was a threat likely. But as I say, with 9-11 and 7-7 not being committed by Islamic extremists, but more perpetrated by our internal intelligence services and government, what could you who could you trust here? I felt that you know these threat levels were deliberately there to exaggerate a fear. So it was a bogus threat that was being created in the minds of the public. The public were accepting this 
And as a result of them accepting it, we're clamouring for work. And this was justifying the aggressive foreign policy and justifying the implementation of draconian legislation that was coming in and the erosion of our civil liberties at a time when we're going through a time of austerity and cutbacks. And this was now becoming so serious, I believe, that it was tantamount to becoming a police state, a fascist police state. And I think the way that I've been treated um, is a case of institutional denial uh, from the time I got dismissed in September 2010 going through the appeal process at the South Yorkshire Police Authority, which was in November 2010, going through the Employment Appeal Tribunal, which happened on a number of occasions in May 2011 and in September, where there was a three-day substantive hearing um, from fair dismissal. All that I experienced and I encountered institutional denial within both the police service and the judicial system and a propensity to tell untruths in order to protect reputations and I think that's sad for me to have to relate back to an aud any audience that having worked with the police for so many years that uh, and co work colleagues that they haven't they're not brave enough to face up to the truth. And I know, really, that when a director of intelligence said, you know, you and I will never get them to tell the truth. And when the director of finance in dismissing me says, your views may well be correct, but it's incompatible with where, where we are today. They're saying to me in the code, we know you're probably right, but we're not prepared to do anything about it, so we've got to get rid of you. Um, you know, they may well not have wanted to get rid of me, but the, there is an issue there as to, if I was making a protected disclosure, they had a duty to investigate. And they're on record in this employment tribunal of, open, of holding their hands up and saying, no, we didn't investigate Mr. Farrell's analysis. Um, so I think there's a potential that the case could be won. And if it is won, then it could be highly embarrassing. Uh, because questions will be asked and analysis will be allowed and although this won't be a criminal court, it will be an employment appeal hearing tribunal, it could still be um, exceptionally embarrassing for senior statesmen in the United Kingdom and senior police officers. Do you think that case will encourage other officers to come forward like you have? Or? Well, I would hope so, but there are there's two ways of looking at it because have they used me as an example to say, look, if you step out of line, this is what happens. We just get rid. We get. Uh, we, we have him out of the way, and um, you know they dismissed me very quickly. And this was after an exemplary record with no allegation of any misconduct. They just got rid. Um, now, does that scare other people off from doing this? Well. I've become quite vocal in the truth movement, I've lost all fear, so I speak out against this and what I have noticed is that police officers are increasingly coming up to me, shaking my hands and saying, Tony, we know you're right, you're doing a grand job, what do we do about this? Um, and they tell me tales about some of the things where they, they know they should be doing something about it, but it's not been addressed properly within senior places in, in, in the police. Uh, so they're concerned, so th there is an increasing body of police officers who are concerned with what's going on across the board within the police service. And um, so I think, that, that by the same token, so me making this stance and actually falling and, and getting the sap, but taking it through what is a reasonably high profile appeal, employment tribunal. Gentlemen. We have two basic suggestions for the design of this 